is full professor of ecotechnology at the University of Ljubljana. And uh, he serves also as a scientific counselor for uh, the environmental sciences at uh, Joseph Stefan Institute in Ljubljana. He has a long career in the field of uh, chemistry, radiochemistry, radioanalytical chemistry, nuclear chemistry. And uh, in particular, he has been a visiting lecturer and also visiting scientist at uh, Fortsum Centrum Ulix, at uh, Ghent University, and also in USA at uh, Oak Ridge Laboratories. He's uh, a scientist uh, uh, very um, important for uh, the nuclear chemistry and radiochemistry. Is a member of many um, society of chemistry and nuclear chemistry, and uh, is also a scientific officer, scientific responsible for many several Euratom project. And uh, we have the, the honor, the pleasure to collaborate with uh, his group in Ljubljana, in particular in the field of uh, uh, the didactical innovation in radiochemistry and nuclear chemistry. And so for us, it's a pleasure <clears throat> to uh, join this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you both. So uh, thank you for this uh, comprehensive <clears throat> introduction, Mario. Uh, today I will talk about uh, neutron activation analysis, which uh, is uh, abbreviated by NAA in, in the literature. So on, on this slide you may see uh, our site uh, where the reactor is located. Uh, this is the reactor building and uh, the facility is located about 10 kilometers from Ljubljana. Uh, I will, uh, my presentation will be given in, in the following order. So I will first uh, say some words about the theory and the basics of neutron activation analysis. Then uh, I will talk about the what are the main approaches and procedures of this uh, technique. What are the analytical characteristics of neutron activation analysis? Uh, I will also touch upon some specific approaches to see how we are doing this at our institute, so Joseph Stefan Institute. Uh, then I will spend some time to show you what uh, what are typical applications uh, and also show you some uh, specific examples of the use of these techniques. And I will finish then with, with a short conclusion. So uh, the <clears throat> neutron activation analysis is actually, it is technique for elemental analysis. Uh, it is an isotope specific technique and uh, we can uh, qualitatively and quantitatively measure uh, elemental masses uh, in the samples. And uh, the basis of the technique is uh, upon the conversion of stable atomic nucleus into radioactive nuclei by irradiation with neutrons. And uh, after that measurement of the radiation uh, emitted during the decay of this uh, radioactive nuclei. Uh, this is uh, the, the definitions which are given by IUPAC. IUPAC is International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry and uh, it is uh, concerned with, with all the issues uh, dealing with, with chemistry. So what are this? it says that uh, this is a measurement principle for measuring elemental or isotopic content 
in a specific amount of material, so in a sample, in which the activity of radionuclides formed are by nuclear reactions of elementary particles or absorption of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so this is the definition of activation analysis, but a bit narrower part of activation analysis is uh, neutron activation analysis. So the IOPAC says that in these cases we specify the type of incident particle or radiation. So in our case this is neutron activation analysis. Uh, we can also use photons or charged particles, then it is called a photon activation analysis or charged particle activation analysis. And we also somehow define the energy of these uh, incident particles. So we can do, for instance, neutron activation analysis with cold neutrons. In this case, it is cold neutron activation analysis. We can do it with epithermal uh, neutrons, with thermal neutrons, uh, or with fast neutrons. I will say a little bit more on this later. So if if we look at uh, some properties of atom or better how how do we assign elements? Uh, so if X is the chemical symbol for an element, then we put here on on the top side uh, usually the mass number. Uh, and this is the number of protons and no, uh, neutrons in the nucleus. And on the left side down, we, we put the so-called Z atomic number, which is number of protons in the nucleus of the atom, which actually tells us what, what element we are talking about. Here you can see uh, some some uh, what is happening, for instance, during ra radio nuclide decay. If there is a beta minus or alpha particle emission or beta plus, then this Z and A they changed, and we we run into uh, different uh, elements or at least uh, different isotopes. Uh, with respect to nuclear reactions, uh, specifically when talking to neutron activation analysis, there are usually two, uh, two basic types. One is the neutron capture, uh, where we are talking about this reaction. So uh, let's say the element uh, or the isotope X uh, uh, captures a neutron and emits a gamma ray. Uh, so this is the, let's say, conventional or classical uh, neutron activation analysis, but we may also have so-called threshold reactions. Uh, there are many of them, uh, for instance, uh, that the, the atom captures one neutron and emits uh, two neutrons or captures neutron and emits uh, proton and so forth. So there are a big selection of, of such uh, reactions. Uh, the difference is that in threshold reactions, the incoming neutrons must have uh, a threshold, uh, meaning that it must have some bigger en energy. Uh, now coming back to, to neutron activation analysis, uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, threshold reactions uh, with this is by done by fast neutrons can also be done in the, the reactor but usually we use different sources uh, then uh, there is a mission of characteristic gamma rays now this is the the area of the the neutron activation analysis with reactor neutrons, uh, so in the reactor we can have thermal, epithermal, under certain conditions also cold neutrons, and uh, when when the neutron hits a target, uh, the, the target captures the 
the neutron and immediately it emits so-called prompt gamma radiation and uh, when we d we are we are detecting this uh, uh, type of the reactions, then we are talking about prompt gamma activation analysis. Uh, the other possibility is that we do also neutron depth profiling uh, using these excited uh, uh, atoms. So after that, uh, this is really immediately uh, in, in, in 10 to minus 14 uh, seconds or so. Uh, then uh, after emitting this gamma ray, the, the atom de-excitates and uh, if, if it emits beta particles, then we can do the measurements by liquid scintillation counting. If it decays uh, some, you know, some different mode, uh, it, it comes to an atom which finally decays, so-called decay gamma radiation, and we usually use this in uh, neutron activation analysis. So uh, just to, to briefly show you the, uh, the uh, principle of prompt gamma neutron activation analysis, uh, in this case we have to extract neutrons from the reactor. So we need to have a neutron beam, sorry. Uh, and uh, we, we expose our sample directly to the beam. And uh, then we have, uh, we do the measurement simultaneously while irradiating the, the uh, the the sample. Uh, now a, a little bit of uh, history. So the uh, so the neutron activation analysis was discovered in nineteen thirty five by George Havesey and. Uh, uh, Hilde Levy. By incident, uh, they were doing some experiments, and during these experiments, they they uh, noticed that the, the the it was a dysprosium they were dealing with, and uh, it activated uh, at that time. So this was the 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 birth of the neutron activation analysis, so it is now already quite old method. Now, uh, coming back about on some specific issues. <clears throat> so as I said, the neutron activation analysis is primarily, primarily uh, analytical technique. Uh, but the difference with other, uh, so to say, conventional methods are, is that it is based on different physical phenomena than other methods which are usually based on determining mass or volume or uh, properties of electron. This one is based on the properties of the, the nucleus. Uh, what we do is that we measure the total mass of chemical elements that are present in all the physical chemical states, so we cannot do speciation analysis. Uh, the physics is fully understood, Every, all the, 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 the formulas can be exactly written. Uh, as, and the, also the contributions of uncertainty to, to the measurement can be quantitatively evaluated. And this is leading us to, to, to a very important issue that uh, this method is metrologically traceable to the SI units and it has a potential of a primary method of analysis. Uh, the process of uh, analysis is uh, written uh, or outlined here. So as with any other method, first we have to 
prepare the sample. So we have a, a sample of interest that we would like to, to, to analyze. Then, depending on the mode, which I will uh, talk about uh, a little bit later, we might, may or may not have a calibrator. So this is, uh, 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 so usually we, we call it standard. So this is the cal calibrator, which contains no amounts of the elements of interest that can be compared then with, with our uh, sample. Then we perform uh, neutron uh, irradiation. Usually we irradiate it together, the sample and the standard. Afterwards, we measure the induced activity, which first uh, leads us to qualitative analysis. And finally, we calculate the amounts based on, on uh, measurement equation and this leads us then to quantitative analysis. Uh, neutron sources that we may have, so there is uh, not only the reactor, we have many uh, other uh, neutron sources. The first category is radioisotopic sources, which might be two components like radium beryllium, uh, plutonium beryllium or spontaneous fission sources like californium 252. We may have particle accelerators, which usually generate monoenergetic neutrons. Uh, uh, there are modern spallation neutron sources, which are still in, in development, but mostly used are, of course, nuclear research, re, uh, research reactors. Uh, this is a typical spectrum of uh, neutrons in a research reactor. So uh, we have uh, thermal flux, then we have epithermal flux, uh, and the fast flux. So here is uh, relative neutron flux versus neutron energy. So the highest is usually thermal flux. Uh, with respect to the types of neutron activation analysis, uh, we have many modes. The, the, the first one is uh, what, what it is called instrumental or also non-destructive. Uh, the specific issue of this is that it, uh, it is without chemical processing after irradiation. So we take the samples as they are, we irradiate them and we measure them as they are without any chemical treatment. Opposite this is so-called radiochemical or destructive uh, activation analysis, uh, where the chemical separation for a specific element is applied after the irradiation. Uh, the, the radiochemical is, of course, uh, more, more sensitive, so the detection limits are much better than with instrumental, but it requires uh, chemical work and also work with radioactive material, but we can achieve better detection limits. Uh, Another separation is uh, based on the types of uh, incoming neutrons. Uh, so we may have uh, epithermal neutron activation analysis. Uh, in this case, uh, if we have a reactor, we put uh, some, some uh, cadmium. Uh, over the sample because the cadmium takes out all the uh, thermal neutrons uh, and remaining epithermal and fast neutrons. And uh, we, we may also have fast neutron activation analysis, which is usually done with uh, neutrons from accelerators, which has uh, much higher energies like the uh, the neutrons uh, in in a reactor. 
Uh, and then we have uh, also uh, some more spe more uh, specialized types, uh, which uh, one is uh, the cyclic NAA, where we irradiate, irradiate the sample, we, we measure it, wait a little bit, irradiate it again, measure it and so on. Uh, so in, in cyclic NAA, uh, we, we don't wait for, for uh, induced radionuclide to decay completely. And in this case, we improve uh, signal to noise ratio. And in a pseudocyclic neutron activation analysis, we wait for a full decay bet between irradiations. And in this case, we don't, do not improve the signal to noise ratio, but we improve the counting statistics. Both these methods are applicable to short lived uh, uh, induced radionuclides. Uh, so, now the equations uh, for the uh, for the neutron activation analysis if we look at the activation and decay the rate of the production which is defined by by change of of a number of uh, nuclei per uh, unit time uh, there are three important uh, matters here first of all number of target nuclei this is uh, a specificity of the sample, so the concentration of the measurement in the sample, number of neutrons bombarding an area per unit time. This is characteristics of our reactor and the activation cross-section, uh, which is uh, specific for a specific nuclear reaction. Uh, now, then we calculate the, the reaction rate of, of uh, each specific uh, nucleus. Actually, we have on one side the, uh, the distribution of neutrons in the reactor, the, what I already showed you, and we have the, the cross-section here, which is also specific for specific reaction. And we have to merge these two, uh, these two uh, uh, functions, and we have to integrate it to all the uh, energies or velocities of the neutrons. Uh, so what what we do is that we measure the number of nuclear decays for us the most simple situation where uh, induced radionuclides nuclide decays immediately to the ground states uh, this uh, this formula is relevant after making uh, integration so you may see that we have here the the flux we have the cross section and uh, we have the number of of the uh, nuclides present in the sample with with some time times uh, of irradiation of measurement and uh, decay during and uh, after uh, during the measurement and uh, in the between of radiation and the measurement uh, now uh, with respect to calibration so the the quantity uh, the subject to measurement is number of disintegrating nuclei or radio z type and uh, so we we measure the counts in a given period of time then uh, we we got uh, disintegration rate by this this gives then the number of dis disintegrating nuclei of radio z top uh, from this we get number of nuclei of stabilizer top. Uh, from this we get a number of nuclei of the element present in the sample, and finally we get we calculate the mass of element. Now the calibration there uh, in NAA there are also several uh, possibilities. The first one is the absolute calibration. So in this case. We, we don't need to use the calibrator at all because we, we can 
calculate everything. So if we kn we know the all the nuclear constants, if we know the flux, if and if we know the 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 detection efficiency, we can calculate it. Uh, but uh, there are so many uncertainties here that uh, usually nobody nowadays is really doing this absolute calibration. The other extreme is uh, relative calibration or comparator calibration. Uh, so here we 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 uh, we uh, irradiate the known amount of an element simultaneously with with the sample, and this is the simplest case. And uh, uh, we have the third possibilities. This is the so-called K zero calibration, and this is. Uh, the mode which we are using in uh, in our uh, reactor, where K0 is some proportional factor, which uh, is experimentally determined for all the possible reactions. Uh, and then we also have all only we have to measure the neutron flux. And we have uh, to know the uh, detector's response to gamma radiation. So this is uh, something between the absolute and the relative method. Uh, the 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 uh, good thing is that we can determine all the elements, all the or the radionuclides we see in the spectra opposite to to the to the relative, where we can only determine the these elements for which we irradiated together also the calibrators uh, now the the formulas uh, of course the absolute method uh, the calculations are the most intense this is just to present you the how this formula would look like so what we need here is a thermal and epithermal neutron flux, which we calculate or estimate from the measurements. Uh, we need cross sections and resonance integrals for the reactions, which we obtain from the literature. We have uh, a number of physical constants, uh, which we need also from the literature. We have to record all the timings and we also need to determine uh, full energy for photon efficiency for the gamma rays we measure, and uh, this uh, has uh, also be, uh, should be done uh, separately via experimental measurements. Now, uh, the relative or comparative methods uh, where we uh, irradiate simultaneously the sample and our standard for one element or for two elements or for five elements for more it becomes a little bit complicated uh, and uh, the equation here is very simple so we we know the mass of the reference so we we measure the the reference activity of the reference and activity of our sample and we got the mass of the, the the element which is in our sample. Uh, if if we know and perform the, the measurement correctly, we can achieve linearity through the entire concentration range. range. And uh, as we measure only the ratios, this brings us to to potential of this method as the primary method of analysis. So the the highest meteorological standards and the, the best performance of the analytical techniques. Uh, now the the K zero method. Uh, here we uh, this is the formula. Uh, we have a K zero factor from the library. We, we have the resonance integrals and um, thermal neutron cross sections uh, also from the from the library. Uh, we <clears throat> we measure the flux distribution. Uh, and uh, we determine the relative efficiency of of uh, 
uh, sample of the nuclides which are present and uh, we measure the activities and uh, do the the we, we record the timing of the measurements uh, irradiation and so on and of course we we have to to take into account any blank we may have so these are the the three uh, basic uh, modes uh, now coming to analytical characteristics of the NAA so what is specific uh, we induce uh, radionuclides each uh, each has uh, specific gamma ray energies uh, specific intensities and specific half life uh, and uh, then we can uh, we can uh, measure different gamma energies of one radionuclide and since one element may have may produce several radionuclides we can also take it into account uh, weighted uh, average of of all the radionuclides uh, of course we have to correct for fast nutrient fission product for the infer interferences which which are specific for the method uh, but this brings us to, to what we call self-validating characteristics, which I explain here from an example. For instance, we, we determine antimony in a sample, and uh, there are two radionuclides which can be produced. So this is antimony 122 and antimony 124. Uh, they have different half-lives, so the first one is 64 hours and the second one 60 days. And they have different gamma lines, so uh, antimony 122, uh, 564 keV and another one 693 keV. And the antimony 124 has also different, three different uh, energies. So we can measure uh, if we determine antimony based on both radionuclides on this all the different different uh, energies and uh, also at different times. So this allows us to 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 check whether the results based on different gamma lines on different uh, radionuclides and different times are consistent and this this would make then uh, that we can be certain in our result result uh, so as i already mentioned that all potential sources of uh, uncertainties can be very well evaluated and quantified uh, we can determine only the total masses uh, and uh, uh, we cannot do the speciation analysis, but on the other hand, we have meteorological traceability to, to SI units, which makes this method very, very useful. Uh, now, which are samples that are particularly well suited for NAA, so from the application side. So these are particularly solid materials that are difficult to be brought into the solution, like glasses, ceramics, uh, carbides, uh, solid materials that are easily to be contaminated during preparation. Uh, as we need only only small or even no preparation of the sample, the uh, possibility to, to contaminate the sample is very low. Uh, then we can analyze solid materials that are unique because uh, we can we may not destroy them. I will show you some some examples later on. Uh, and uh, materials which uh, lack appropriate metrics may matching calibrators. Uh, this is uh, in particular uh, uh, suitable for per performing uh, uh, trace level uh, analysis and panoramic elemental characterization. So for the purpose of quality assurance and quality control in chemical measurements. 
now here are listed uh, what what, uh, what kind of uh, samples uh, are suitable for NAA from plastics, environmental materials, high purity compounds, uh, animal, human tissues, forensics, archaeological uh, artifacts, and so on. Uh, this is comparison of of uh, instrumental neutron activation analysis with some competitors in terms of uh, methods. Uh, so we see there are uh, the, the strengths are in particular that there are no chemical matrix effects. It is multi-element and uh, it is very suitable for bulk analysis. Uh, so if we Co compare the classical analytical measurements with neutron activation analysis. For classical, we, we know that usually uh, we have to use uh, calibrations which are very limited in, 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 in the range. So there are usually uh, about three orders of magnitude only. So we have to, to construct calibration curve or use a method of standard uh, addition, while in neutron activation analysis uh, we can uh, assume linearity from the detection limit to actually practically 100%, so to over nine orders of magnitude. Uh, this is the setup which we are using in our reactor. So this is a pneumatic irradiation system. We insert the samples uh, here, uh, send it to the reactor, and then it comes back and goes in the in the laboratory for uh, a further analysis. Uh, this is how do we prepare the samples. So we we pack the the samples in small polyethylene vials. We put the zirconium and aluminum gold wires uh, on the top and on the bottom. This is to compensate for any flux uh, variation uh, over the height of the uh, polyethylene vial. And with, with gold and zirconium, we monitor the flux and the shape of the, the flux uh, in the reactor. So we prepare the sample, we radiate, we measure activity and we do the calculations. Uh, usually we try to, to, to do the pellets, uh, to have a, a well-defined geometry of the measurement because with respect to gamma spectrometric measurement, this is a Im relatively important issue. So we pack the samples uh, as uh, I showed in the previous slide. We irradiate it, then uh, the, the radionuclides are uh, activated. Uh, then we separate the, the uh, monitors, uh, the calibrators and the sample. We measure it and we perform the data analysis. Uh, so usually gamma spectrometry is used where we have to perform absolute e efficiency calibration of the gamma spectrometer. In our case, uh, since we are using the K0 NAA, this is uh, uh, just a sketch of setup, a little bit old, uh, as you may see from the monitors, but nevertheless, uh, these are the detectors which are very well shielded with the LED. Uh, we may have uh, so-called well-type detectors where the sample is completely surrounded uh, by, by the body of the detector for better efficiency, or we can use uh, uh, the simple uh, planar geometry for the measurement. Uh, now, the major fields of applications, uh, as I already briefly mentioned, geological, uh, mapping, environmental monitoring, health-related studies, trace contaminants in high-purity materials, uh, trace elements in agriculture, uh, halogen analysis, which is quite important as uh, it is sometimes, it is different to analyze uh, halogens and what is very important, certification of 
uh, reference materials, so uh, both uh, NIST and uh, BIS, uh, ERMM, they are using uh, neutron activation analysis for certifying reference materials, and we are taking part actively in, in campaigns for certification purposes. Now some examples. Uh, I hope you may see that uh, so here is our archaeological, geological, environmental samples, so like uh, sediments, like extraterrestrial materials, uh, archaeological studies and so on, then biological materials, where I would say, for instance, iodine determination, it is quite important since uh, iodine is, of course, essential element and it is difficult to be determined by many other methods. Uh, materials and uh, industrial applications, uh, uh, for instance, this is an um, interesting uh, area in, in Canada where they're using arsenic in in uh, in house building which are made from wood and of course arsenic is toxic element so this uh, should be controlled and this is extensively studied by neutron activation analysis and there are many many other uh, applications like uh, silver coins uh, like napoleon's hair like uh, organo halogens uh, so, organo, uh, organic uh, substances as well. These are a few examples. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we performed some uh, uh, studies on uh, air pollution. This was taken in in Chile, where you can it can be seen the the high. Uh, pollution by by air pollution so then uh, we prepared some air filters uh, as a standards for intercomparisons uh, to be used by uh, different uh, participants in the studies uh, this uh, shows you an interesting problem of how how to get uh, a representative sample from a sewage sludge uh, so in this case, uh, uh, it is possible. There are also special mode of of uh, neutron activation analysis, which is called uh, large sample large sample uh, neutron activation analysis, where a kilogram samples can be uh, can be determined. Uh, and uh, it is much easier to, to get uh, a kilogram of uh, homogeneous or representative sample from such a site rather than a few milligrams. Uh, so, as I said, large samples, uh, the, the, some laboratories, they also analyze the whole uh, artifacts. So, uh, not to, th th there is no need to destroy these precious uh, archaeological artifacts. Uh, and uh, further examples, uh, this is one example from our laboratory where we studied vanadium in blood. Uh, this was uh, some years ago an important issue where people were studying uh, whether vanadium is essential or not. Uh, it is also difficult to, to get the blood samples uh, because of the stainless steel needles which contain uh, vanadium. And uh, you can see what, what low, extremely low level we found. So it is 23 picograms per milliliter. The uncertainty was very high. But at uh, this uh, very low levels, uh, it is more important to get the order of magnitudes rather than to to have a, a small uncertainty. And you may see that the the peak area was uh, about a hundred counts or something like that. And uh, furthermore, this requires very fast work because. Uh, 
the, this vanadium radionuclide has a half-life of uh, uh, a little bit more than three minutes and all the chemical separation should be done very quickly uh, to avoid that the, the radionuclide would uh, decay completely during the processing. This is another example where they studied the bullet from from assassination of uh, 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 President Kennedy. They analyzed antimony uh, here and they they can conclude that that uh, the two bullets only hit the victim, not more. This is another example of studying extraterrestrial uh, material from meteorites from 1935 and 91 and it could be confirmed this is multi-elemental analysis that the materials were quite similar. Uh, another example of analysis of Napoleon's hair uh, here the masses were extremely low. You may see it is 0.2 milligrams only because the single hairs were analyzed for a number of elements uh, by neutron activation analysis and it was concluded that the arsenic poisoning was not the major reason for Napoleon's death. And uh, uh, this uh, is then the example of uh, such scrap material uh, and uh, in this case one kilogram material was analyzed using the K0 uh, neutron activation analysis and uh, also uh, there is also some uh, examples of analysis of cadmium in shredded computer parts which were determined in 1.5 kilogram samples. So this brings me to the end. Uh, and uh, I would just like to say that, that um, neutron activation analysis through all its varieties, as you see, there are, there are many, many uh, possibilities. It's not just one. A neutron activation analysis, but uh, several modes uh, where we can use uh, different types of um, uh, or different energies of the neutrons uh, for specific materials or specific measurements. Uh, and the preferred analysis uh, in NAA is that we do with solid materials and the materials which are difficult to be brought in the solution because this is the advantage of NAA over uh, the other methods where we, we you, you are forced to use the liquid uh, samples and uh, if uh, somebody would like, there are many uh, available examples in the scientific uh, literature. Finally, uh, coming to this picture, uh, so this is the, the top-down picture of our reactor. And uh, uh, you may see here, here is the core of the reactor and this is the specific uh, Cherenko radiation. And this picture was taken at the time, I think it was three or four o'clock in the morning when, when, when the day was uh, coming up, so that the, the color of, of outside was almost the same as the color of the Cherenko uh, radiation in, in the reactor. So this this picture was published in uh, National Geographic uh, uh, and uh, it was quite an effort to 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 make this picture. Uh, so I think it took them seven hours or so. Uh, with this uh, presentation, I, I would like uh, to, to, to finish uh, my my lecture and I would like to thank everybody for listening and I'm available for and taking any questions. Thank you.
thank you both. Uh, a very nice presentation, uh, comprehensive and also fascinating for the results uh, <clears throat> that you presented at the end. Uh, very, very nice. And um, I, I have a question. Um, in your opinion, when you can consider mandatory the prone gamma neutron activation analysis? Because I think that uh, the, the facility for the PROM gamma is uh, quite uh, um, complicated or quite uh, difficult or not. Because yes. in, in Italy, I think that uh, Saverio Altieri is, uh, is going to, to build up a, a facility for PROM gamma, but um, not before, not in the year before. Yeah, well, well, it is it is a big investment uh, as as a as a first, because um, first of all, uh, it is it is the safety. As as I said, you have to extract uh, the the beam from from the reactor, which is which is not uh, which is not uh, simple. Uh, as we have in our reactor and as you have in your trigger so the 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 vessel where the the core is is more or less closed okay there are some beam lines but uh, then you, you the the problem comes uh, with the flux because uh, uh, it is not just to extract the the beam it must also have uh, a high flux if you like to uh, use it for analytical purposes so then of course it is the problem of of um, nuclear safety uh, with 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 all the facility everything has to be to be safe and what what people are usually doing is that they are also using uh, cold neutrons instead of thermal because the the cross sections uh, for the cold neutrons are higher so from an analytical point of view uh, it is much more profitable to to have uh, uh, the cold neutrons so it, it is actually a big uh, technical question and uh, also, also a matter of funds. Uh, as far as I know, the, 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 the very well operating facilities in Europe are in Budapest and in Munich. Uh, and of course, uh, the, also the the number of elements i mean the reactions are, are different so the sensitivities are quite different so uh, in the past they were using this uh, particularly for analysis of uh, of hydrogen which uh, you cannot analyze by classical neutron activation analysis at all. It is very sensitive to cadmium and so on. It also requires uh, 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 more demanding preparation of samples because usually it has to be uh, to have a thin layer and uh, usually everything has to be in vacuum and so on. Uh, so yeah, if if uh, if somebody has the 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 means, uh, the money, and the technical capabilities, uh, and of course the applications, uh, because probably I I would assume that the solely use of of uh, NAA or PG NAA prompt gamma activation analysis would not be profitable. So uh, once you extract the beam, probably it's good to, to have uh, nuclear physicists around to perform another studies, not, not only for analytical purposes. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I have a question, uh, a curiosity. What are the results I expect from the analysis of the air pollution? Uh, well, 
this this was actually this was a project uh, which was uh, started by International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, and uh, they provided uh, special samplers because uh, if we go if you go for air pollution there there is also a problem of availability of suitable samplers uh, so uh, the uh, IAEA international atomic energy agency they provided uh, many countries i think at the end uh, there were more than 50 50 uh, countries participating they were using the so-called Ghent stacked filter units which collects uh, the airborne particles so one has to be specific so it, it is not air pollution but airborne so the particles which are in the air and these particles were filtered through, through these facilities to get uh, to get uh, the fractions less than 2.5 uh, micrometers and fraction from 2.5 uh, to 10, so which is called uh, inhalable and respirable uh, fractions. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, well, the results, generally speaking, they were. Uh, as as it expected so in in uh, developing countries the 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 values were higher uh, he, he, here in europe they were lower uh, and um, yeah then as far as i know this this project was then continuing uh, in europe and then they changed the uh, the sampler uh, because the problem is the quantity of the sample you can collect. So this, these masses are usually very low and it is in particular problem when, when the atmosphere is relatively clear because then you may get two micro, uh, two milligrams or five milligrams of sample only. On the other hand, if the pollution is high with these specific samplers, the the uh, the sampler gets clocked and uh, so it's it doesn't suck air anymore. Uh, the so therefore there are other methods which are perhaps more more appropriate like like PIXA uh, because uh, for PIXA analysis you you need uh, much less sample and you can take more fractions and so on uh, but uh, yeah this was uh, kind of of promotion of neutron activation analysis by the the IAEA so that we prove that we can do it but uh, in fact coming to the air pollution as uh, in general or airborne air particles pollution uh, because then uh, it is not enough to to do elemental analysis then you have to do also uh, ion analysis like uh, sulfates uh, phosphates nitrates you have to do black carbon uh, bec uh, as as uh, the final goal is to close the mass so, so that you 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 have the content of all the mass you collect, not only the the trace elements which we determined. It, this was only a small fraction, because what is important are the next steps, not only to to analyze uh, the content, but uh, to 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 do the uh, source apportionment. So to to determine where this pollution is coming from. Uh, and what portion of pollution is coming, let's say, from industrial part, from from uh, uh, traffic, from uh, from the sea, because uh, uh, in many countries uh, the main component would be sodium and chlorine coming from the sea, from the sea spray and so on. So uh, this is a big problem, and we were just 
uh, dealing with very small part of of the problem. So these are the trace elements. Uh, of course, we we did the mass because what you usually do is to to measure the mass of PM 2.5 or now it is PM 2 or PM 10, and there are uh, limits uh, by legislation which are the limits, and then you look if you are over or if you are lower. Uh, the role of, of the, the, the levels of uh, trace elements, they are defined only for few elements, not for all of them. Also the mechanisms of, of uh, influence on human health of this particular uh, trace elements is, is, uh, is not very clear. It's more clearer that what the particles do. So these are intensive studies which uh, are still in progress and there is still a lot of work to be done uh, here. So, Bor, thank you again. Your presentation and your webinar will be uh, available in uh, the MOOC uh, site, POC in Polymy, and so all the students are um, invited to, <clears throat> to, to see the MOOC and also all the webinars that uh, uh, has been uh, offered during this time.